the things that uh, I'm going to try to do is make this applicable to your clinical practice. This topic that I'm going to be talking about today, functional genomics, is a rather new field. How many people are using functional genomics in their practice today? Aha! Okay. I've been at this for about 10 years. And for the last 10 years, what I've been looking at is to, instead of guessing uh, what nutrients people need, doing functional genomic testing can actually highlight where the specific nutrients are appropriate and needed in a particular person's prevention or treatment strategy. And because of that information, we can now tailor and individualize specific nutrient programs that speak to genes directly. How many people have had a nutrition course in the last three years? Excellent. When I was in graduate school, they taught us that nutrition was basically to keep you growing and developing and maturing. We didn't have a lot of information about how specific nutrients spoke to genes. I, I'm going to say that again. Nutrients speak to genes. They either upregulate or downregulate genetic expression. This is a very important concept today because nutrition is now becoming more biochemical and molecular genetic as a curriculum as opposed to vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, yada, yada, yada. So one of the things that I'm going to be introducing you today is this, func this concept of functional genomics. The next concept is nutrigenomics. And last, pharmacogenomics. The title of the presentation is a key to personalized and individualized medicine using genomics. These two topics are actually separate. And I'll be going through a little uh, review of how personalized medicine came into being and now how individualized medicine is becoming more of the uh, more of an art rather than uh, what it used to be which is basically guessing as to how to direct someone's treatment or strategy program. As Bob indicated I have a clinical practice in Santa Fe, New Mexico um, and part of this practice was to not only inclu in include genetics in identifying some risk for certain people, but also looking at their genomic profile as well. How many people have had a genetics course recently? Not too many. When I was in graduate school, unfortunately, we were taught an old methodology. And when we work with clinical, in a clinical practice with patients, that information about inherited diseases only accounts for about 5 to 10 percent of the disease rates that you see in chronic diseases. The other 90 to 95 percent is a function of genes, environment, and nutrition. So when you do an intake on a particular patient and you are picking up inherited variabilities and probabilities, there's another 90 to 95 percent that you're not seeing. And this is what functional genomics is all about. It's actually taking a look at what's beyond and what's hidden beyond what you're seeing on an intake form. So the learning objectives for today will one be defining functional genomics and how it relates to personalized and individualized medicine. The second will be explaining how genomics is a tool to help you and help me better create an individualized program for that person who is basically looking for a treatment or a prevention strategy. We, I'm going to also give you some clinical examples of how I use genomics as it relates to personalized medicine. And personalized medicine is now called pharmacogenomics. It's basically, pharmaco means drugs, genomics means your genes, how the two relate to one another. We know that many, many thousands of people every year have adverse drug reactions. 
and there has been an effort on the part of the drug industry since around 1999 to reduce those numbers. It's been estimated between 800 to a, a million people report adverse drug reactions to their doctors which then get reported to the NIH. That's, those are the ones that get reported. Probably millions of others are not reported. And last we're going to see some examples of individualized medicine in a self-insured, self-managed company. Because one of the things that I have been interested in over the last couple of years is actually seeing whether functional genomic testing used in a proper setting could actually reduce health care costs. I'll hold you in suspense until we get to the end of the presentation. This is a great cartoon because I think there's a dual message here. It talks about, um, let's see if I can use this, it talks about the interpersonal relationship between a patient and a doctor. And the idea here is that the barcode could be used as something that the physician could actually grab onto and individualize that particular person. That barcode is your DNA. No one in this room has the same DNA. I have an identical twin brother. Our, our, would you suspect that our DNA is the same? Yes? No? Some. The answer is here. Your DNA changes as you age. It makes mistakes. It is not the same as you had when you were a kid. And therefore it's important to evaluate your DNA because these changes in your DNA called SNPs, I'll go for, over this in a minute, single nucleotide polymorphisms set you up for disease processes later in your life. We don't see chronic diseases in teenagers, typically. We don't see chronic diseases in our 20s. We see them in our fifth, sixth, and seventh decade of our lives. And because of these changes in our DNA, they set you up for these chronic diseases. So one of the things that I'll be sharing with you is some of the work that I've been doing with a company locally here in Florida, just in Dania Beach, called the American Maritime Officers, who have incorporated functional genomic testing into their health and wellness program. I want to make clear that between genetics Epigenetics, because these are terms that are, we are using with some frequency uh, in the lay press as well as in the scientific press. And I want to contrast that with genomics and these two categories, nutrigenomics and pharmacogenomics. Mendelian genetics is what most of us learned in college, in Genetics 101, or who went on to graduate school and learned that if you had a dominant or recessive trait, it was usually associated with a dominant or recessive gene. It also led us to believe that medical determinism, because once one of these genes was out of whack, it led to typically an inborn error of metabolism, which then leads to a disease process. Again, this is only 10 to 15 percent of the incidence of chronic diseases that we are facing today.